Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm excited uh, to be here today to talk uh, about a, actually a new open source project that we're, uh, we've launched at Databricks uh, to accelerate the machine learning lifecycle. Uh, so as you saw in, in uh, Professor Rodi's talk, uh, machine learning has huge potential to transform basically everything we do from kind of our day-to-day -day interactions with technology to going to space and so on. Um, and uh, it's, it's obviously a very exciting time to be working on that. Uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of challenges with turning that into reality, into, uh, you know, even working computer applications, let alone, you know, say a working spaceship. Uh, and this is what I want to talk about today. So first, just a little bit about uh, Databricks and my background. So um, I'm been part of this company, Databricks, uh, since we started in 2013. Uh, it was founded by the original creators of Apache Spark, the team of researchers that started the project at UC Berkeley. And we provide basically a unified uh, analytics environment in the cloud for everything from data science and engineering to machine learning. So our customers work across this whole set of technologies and problems, and we get to see what the problems are. And we have uh, customers in a, in a wide variety of industries. Um, in, including uh, a lot of customers um, uh, now in Europe. Um, and so working across these customers, we see some of the common trends and, and problems they have with using machine learning and big data and production. So the main thing that we see, and I'm sure everyone else who has uh, started doing it sees the same, is that machine learning development is actually extremely complex today. And uh, it's, it's more complex than traditional software development because of specific challenges that come up uh, in machine learning because of its probabilistic nature, because of problems such as overfitting, because of the many parameters and so on. So to illustrate some of that problem, I'm just going to show a picture of the machine learning life cycle um, and uh, explain some of the issues that come up. So here is a kind of a simplified machine learning life cycle to, to show the issues. So first of all, machine learning begins with data. By definition, machine learning is, uh, you know, is, uh, is, is computer software that, uh, that learns or uh, improves the result based on data. Uh, and of course, machine learning works better the more data you have and the more diverse and high quality it is for the problem at hand. Um, so that's kind of the first, the first thing you need. Second thing you need is data preparation. That's where a lot of big data uh, technologies come in, like Apache Spark, to actually get the data into a shape usable by various algorithms. Then you've got, of course, the machine learning training. And finally, uh, you have deployment, you know, where you actually have this on in production and monitor it and maintain it. And then if the machine learning application is doing, you know, anything important, you probably want to collect more data about how it's doing in deployment and feed that back in, as we saw, for example, with all the measurement systems uh, you know, on, on the spacecraft. So what are some of the challenges? So the first challenge is that there are just a lot of tools involved at every stage of this process. For example, data can be in a huge range of storage systems that are available today. And again, in machine learning, you know, you usually do better with more data. So you want to combine all these sources uh, into your uh, application. For data preparation, we've got a huge range of tools and algorithms. So things like Apache Spark or SQL or Python uh, or, or, you know, or libraries such as Scikit-Learn and Pandas and so on um, uh, that are available for that. For training, there's an even larger array of um, algorithms and libraries, anything from you know, kind of linear models to, um, uh, to decision trees to deep learning and many different implementations of each one. And finally, for deployment, there are also a huge range of tools and environments where you want to deploy your model. Now, normally in just traditional software development, you've got a lot of tools to choose from at each stage of the life cycle, but you can just choose one. So for example, for your web application, you choose you know, one database, you choose one web framework, you know, one JavaScript framework, and you're done. But the problem in machine learning is that your goal is just to produce the best result possible. So your job is actually to try out all the algorithms and keep improving the model and try to get the best result. You can't just say, oh, we'll be using linear models and that's it, and we'll be using you know, one data preparation step. So unlike traditional software development, you have to be able to run and interoperate with all these tools. So that's kind of the first problem. 
Second problem is that some of these tools have an additional dimension, which is tuning. So they have many configurable uh, parameters or hyperparameters. And this basically adds a new dimension to your life cycle where you have to figure out, well, you know, when I ran with uh, this processing step, what, what did I set you know, these tuning parameters to? And that's very difficult to keep track of, and it, it needs to be a first class concept in your workflow. Um, then the scale, all of these steps need to operate at high volumes of data or they will operate you know, at high volumes of data in, in production. Uh, so all of them have to be designed to scale. Um, uh, then there's actual model exchange or code exchange across these. So how do you get you know, some, some data preparation stuff that's written in Python and Pandas to then be deployed you know, in production when you've got an iPhone app or something like that? That's the type of challenge you need to deal with is passing these, this code and models between teams. Um, and then the final issue you have um, is governance. So anytime you have you know, a large uh, company or a, a company in a regulated space, you want to be able to keep track of what you did, you know, make sure you're not uh, using uh, features that you're prohibited to use, and so on. So these are all challenges that you have to deal with in machine learning that maybe don't come up uh, as much in traditional software development. So what are, uh, so just some, some examples of this from a couple of uh, customers that talked to us. So this is actually the, the chief scientist at an ad tech firm. This is a smaller company, but this person runs, you know, sort of a, a data science team of a few data scientists there. Um, and they say, I built hundreds of models per day to lift revenue. The goal of the, this whole goal of the team is to increase the company's revenue by predicting, you know, things about uh, what, what people uh, will, will uh, click more, uh, better. Um, and they'll use any machine learning library, MLlib, PyTorch, R, etc. cetera. Uh, so they're, they're constantly trying new things that are coming out, new algorithms to see whether they help with the problem. But unfortunately, there's no easy way to see what the data went into a model from a week ago and rebuild it. So they have this whole problem of keeping track of what they did as they're using this wide range of tools. And similar problems happen in, in much larger companies as well. So this is a, a large consumer electronics firm, and they say our company has 100 teams doing machine learning worldwide, and we can't uh, share work across the teams. When a new team tries to run some code that was written by someone else, it often doesn't even give the same result. And they have lots of horror stories where you know, you've got experts in one country trying to look at a model built in a different country, and they can't even get it running, let alone actually use their expertise to make it better. Okay, so what are people doing about this problem? So one trend that's really begun in the industry and it's happening in, um, in sort of companies of all scale is the idea of machine learning platforms. So some of the best known ones are these internal software systems at uh, large web companies uh, who have uh, you know, written about them and explained how they use them. So some examples are Facebook FB Learner, Uber Michelangelo, Google CFX, but many other companies are building platforms as well. And the, the idea of these ML platforms Platforms is let's put some structure, some APIs along around the ML development process so that uh, we can make certain uh, guarantees about it. Like we can make sure that we can deploy the same job in production or we know how to move the model into a new platform or something like that. So the benefit of these platforms is that they standardize the machine learning development lifecycle. Uh, so data preparation, training, and deployment. Basically, as long as you work within the APIs that you know, the designer of the platform built, um, they make sure, the engineering team that builds it, make sure that your code is deployable in production and can be monitored and can be retrained and so on in a standard way. So you don't need to reinvent that each time for every new ML application. Um, and these, you know, this is a very successful model in these companies. There are basically dozens of applications using these internally, which is great. Uh, but there are also some limitations. So one of the main limitations we see talking to users of these systems is that they're limited to the algorithms and frameworks that the platform supports. So there's often an engineering team that supports you know, maybe 10, 20 different um, algorithms or maybe one specific framework and one specific software version. And if you work with that, everything is great. But if you want to go and try something new, um, it, you know, it, it, you're kind of on your own. And remember I mentioned at the beginning, you know, when your job is to improve some metric in the company, you know, like every percent in improvement leads to millions of dollars of revenue, you want to be able to try everything uh, that's available, every new technique, and see how it helps with that. And then the other challenge is that each platform is tied to each company's internal infrastructure, and so it's very hard to move things around, even to change infrastructure internally. 
So we looked at this problem at Databricks, and starting at the beginning of this year, we asked ourselves, you know, can we provide some of the same benefits of uh, these platforms, but in an open manner, both open source and also open in that you can bring whatever technology you want uh, into these systems and, uh, you know, and have it work by default, as opposed to being limited to whatever the system decided to support. And so that's what we're doing in this, uh, op is in this new project called MLflow. It's an open source machine learning platform, and it's also designed to be open in terms of the interface, in terms of what can run in it. So it's designed to be able to work with any machine learning library and language. It's not limited to a few things. Uh, and to run these the same way everywhere, or in particular, you know, we are a, a cloud company running in the public cloud, so we want to make sure things run the same in every public cloud, so you're not dependent on one. On, on one provider. Um, and um, it's also designed, of course, to scale to big data and to integrate well with Apache Spark because that's something uh, that we know how to do well. Um, we launched the project in June, so it's still a pretty new project, uh, but it's actually grown quite a bit as an open source community. So we already have over 50 contributors to the project, many new features uh, that were built both by us and by community members, and at least like a few dozen uh, distinct companies contributing code to the project. So it's exciting to see that people are interested in, a, in this idea and to see what's happening with them. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how MLflow is designed, and then I'll go into, into some of the details. And we, we actually have a more kind of hands-on talk on MLflow uh, tomorrow at the conference as well. Um, so there's kind of two uh, items, two elements of MLflow's design philosophy that also make it <coughs> a little bit um, different from some of the company-specific ML platforms. So the first is that it's an API-first, or what we call open interface platform. So we want to make sure you can submit runs of your code, models, experiments, and so on, from any machine learning libraries and language, so that by default, MLflow just kind of works with whatever technology you choose, as opposed to you blocking on us to make something available. So one really simple example of this is, you know, think about uh, deploying a model. What is a model? There are a lot of formats for models like Onyx and PMML and so on that try to capture all the weights and internals, but affecting the output um, and use that to improve your model as well. So very, um, you know, ki kind of uh, simple concept. It's like, let's log what we're doing, uh, keep track of it in a database, and then be able to see uh, and compare the results. Um, so that's kind of the first part, is, is MLflow tracking, is just this API. The second part is MLflow projects. So this is a way to make it so that someone else can run your code again. And this is, again, a very simple uh, design. It's, it's this little spec file you can include with your project in your Git repository that says how to run it and can declare an environment and dependencies. So if you develop your project with this type of spec, you can then push it uh, and anyone can run it again later. And one of the great things about this is that different people can be running it later. So to run a project, you just need to type mlflow run and, uh, and pass in a URL for the project, and then uh, you know, it'll just be able to execute. Um, so what does it look like? Just very briefly, uh, it's, you know, your project is just a directory with some code, maybe data files, whatever you want to put in it. Uh, it can live in a Git repository. Um, and uh, you have this little descriptor file that describes an environment, uh, such as, you know, uh, required Python libraries, and also describes parameters to the project and how to call the project. So anyone can call it just by passing these parameters, and it's sort of self-documenting how to run this on new data or how to, how to change change the parameters. And you can run this either from the command line or using an API uh, to have a script that sets up a multi-step workflow. Um, and then the final component is models. Again, um, it's actually a pretty simple concept. It's basically uh, a way to package up models um, that um, ca ca can expose different APIs, which we call flavors, for, for doing inference using the model. So whatever library you're using for training, you can, uh, you can package the result into an MLflow model, and then we provide built-in tools where you can take any model and deploy it as a REST server, for example, on Docker or Kubernetes, um, as a batch or, or streaming job, for example, in, in Apache Spark, uh, or just as code that you can call in a, you know, in a programming language. 
And again, the design is uh, each, each model is basically has got some arbitrary files that you saved. Each model is just a folder with some contents. And it has this descriptor file that says how to uh, load it into different formats. And in particular, you know, one of the formats is just load this as a Python function. So any tool that understands Python can just apply this. Other formats are more library specific. So for example, this one you can load as a TensorFlow graph as well. So if you're back in TensorFlow, you can actually load it back in and modify the graph and do things with it. Uh, so this simple descript and this descriptor format also captures when the model was made and stuff like that. So what does this mean for deployment? So instead of now, instead of the data scientist throwing lots of different frameworks over the wall at the engineer, the data scientist just say, hey, please deploy this MLflow model. And there's a standard interface for using it in various modes. So the production engineer can just plug it in and, and do either uh, real time or batch scoring with it. Um, and likewise, if you want to run your training code in production, you just say, please uh, run this MLflow project. The production engineer doesn't need to know what's inside it, even what programming language is it in or anything like that, uh, because they just have a standard interface for running it. Okay. So that's sort of a, a brief overview of MLflow. Um, so since the project started, it's, it's been actively developed, and we've got a lot of new features since our first release. Um, so we've got uh, both we and, and different people in the community have contributed model packaging uh, interfaces for a lot of common libraries. So you don't have to write that descriptor file yourself. You can just uh, call a function to save your model, and then all the MLflow deployment tools work with it. Um, R Studio contributed an R API. Uh, we're really excited about that because they're very good at building really excellent R APIs and um, it's great to see that in there. Uh, we've got a Java and Scala API in addition to R and Python. And we've also got um, pluggable storage backends for a wide variety of storage systems. And uh, just a couple of days ago, we released the next version, MLflow 0.8, which brings uh, more improvements, especially around the UI, visualizing multi-step workflows, uh, compact table view, and also letting you take your model and deploy it uh, to Azure ML Serving Workspace, which is a new serving product on Azure uh, based on Kubernetes. So uh, basically, all your previous models can now be pushed to this as well. Um, some examples of use cases. So uh, MLflow is, 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 is open source, so uh, there, are, there are people using it through that. And we're also working with a number of Databricks customers uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to develop and, and try the system early on. Um, so examples, a uh, European energy company is actually using MLflow tracking to build um, and monitor hundreds of machine learning models for entities in the energy grid. Uh, so this is a case where you know, they want to model every power plant, every renewable energy source, every consumer of electricity as well, like a town or a factory. And so that's kind of hundreds of distinct uh, machine learning problems. And they use MLflow to keep track of these and make sure that they have the best model and that it doesn't regress for each specific task. Um, uh, mark an online uh, marketplace uh, working with us is using MLflow projects to package and run uh, reproducible deep learning experiments using Keras. So you develop the experiment on your laptop and then you can kick off runs in parallel on GPU instances in the cloud and compare the results and keep track of what went into each one. Um, and then an online retailer is using our model packaging format to package and deploy a, a recommendation model with custom logic. So they found that you know, it's, it's not enough for them to just take an off-the-shelf recommendation model and, and serve that as a REST API. Uh, the data science team wants to write a lot of logic around that with you know, business rules uh, to, to customize the recommendations that are coming out. And they like that with MLflow, you can develop these together and package them together and ship one artifact to the production team that captures you know, both the weights of the model and that version of the business logic that you had. So you don't have to split it up across you know many little applications to do this okay so these are just some examples so anyway, just to summarize, machine learning platforms we think are a very important new part of the, of the data science and big data toolkit. And if designed well, they can simplify ML development for both data scientists and engineers. That's a key thing that we noticed is that uh, you know, if you've got the right abstractions, the data scientist is more productive just working by themselves and, and they're excited to use it. And at the same time, it makes it easier to deploy. Whereas today, 
in a lot of organizations, these two groups are at, at odds where the data engineers tell you, well, you can't use this, you can't use that, because otherwise you won't deploy your model. Um, MLflow is, uh, is uh, easy to install. You can just install it uh, through pip and, and start using it in Python. We also have um, a bunch of uh, you know, uh, pretty extensive documentation and tutorials on the website. Um, and if you're interested in seeing more about it, including a hands-on uh, sort of walkthrough of using it with deep learning, uh, Jules Damji from Databricks is presenting this uh, tomorrow as well. So thanks a lot and uh, happy to uh, answer any questions. Oops. Okay. Hi. Okay. It's time for the question. Yes. So if there is any question, it's time to ask Matei. If not, I have many questions. Okay. Yeah. Your face is like, please, no, <laughs> no question. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. Here, okay, here. I, I okay. actually can't see you guys, so. Fortunately <laughs> for you. They are moving the hand. You cannot see. But it's hard so. because of the lights, yeah. Yeah. Now the microphone arrives at time. Yes. Thank, thanks for the talk, Made. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I have a question about the integration between ML Leap Spark and, mm -hmm. and ML Flow. Because with some friends, we try it, and it's very nice. But what happens with these models that are called in ML Flow in Scala? Because I think that the most the main of the IPA is in, in Python. Oh yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so I think loading, yeah, loading the model in Scala right now, you'd have to do it manually from the serialized uh, um, code for it. Uh, so that's actually something that we're working on to just provide a Java and Scala API. So that part is just, we're just not done with it yet. Okay, you, you have yeah. the roadmap to integrate an, uh, a native uh, way to do it, right? Yeah, we will, yes, yeah, the, so, yeah, a lot of these integrations are still in development, so that's, yeah, definitely good feedback, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pass it back to the team, yeah. Thank you, thank you uh -huh. so much. Yep. Until the next question arrives, I have one. Okay. What do you think that is gonna be the future for MLflow? Mm -hmm. in yeah, the, in, in the next few years, yeah, that's going to happen. That's a great question. Yeah, so actually, we so the the pieces I showed today are kind of just the beginning of what we want to build. So uh, we also um, are planning components of MLflow around monitoring models that are deployed, uh, and, and also a component that's basically a model registry. So you can it's kind of like a centralized repository where you keep track of the models inside your company. And we've got a lot of interesting ideas and uh, and feedback there. So our goal is really to uh, uh, you know, to build kind of a complete platform that works together. And, and we try to design these pieces so uh, these are just things you can add on to the current workflow. So even though, you know, the, the monitoring and, and so on aren't, uh, you know, aren't available yet, we were kind of thinking about them since the beginning so that they will work with the existing workflows. Um, the other thing we care a lot about um, in general at Databricks is just making sure that the platform is very solid. So we're moving, you know, we're going towards MLflow 1.0 version, which will have uh, basically a stable interface so you can build on it and it keeps working the same way each time we upgrade it as well. So that's probably something you'll see, um, you know, b basically early next year or towards the first half of next year. So we have, yeah, we, we're excited to keep, um, you know, keep building this out. I have Hi. more questions. Hi. Oh. Ah, another one. No, mm -hmm. I'm here. Okay. Okay. The other, the other. Right, right. Ah, oh, there yeah. you are. Okay, oh. great. <laughs> Sorry, it's very hard great to see. Thank you. <laughs> it's really simple. Okay. Uh, how many companies are, are using this tool uh, at this moment? How and, many uh, companies? And how big they are? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the companies I talked about before, um, they're, uh, well, I guess w one of them was a smaller one, uh, the retailer one I talked, but they're, they're large enterprise companies and uh, there was a European one and a US one that I talked about before. And we have a number of other customers as well that are using this in, uh, in life sciences um, and in, uh, in finance and in other domains. Um, in terms of the community, it's hard to tell. We actually want to run a survey of this to, to figure it out, but um, the contributors, um, as I said, there's around 50 uh, total contributors to the project, actually a little bit more now, and our team that works on it is uh, is six engineers plus myself. So uh, we, we have, um, 
Yeah, exactly. So, so it's a lot of non-database contributors, and usually, you know, if someone submits a patch, it means that they've at least, you know, tried it out to the point that you know they kind of want to use it and make it better. So, um, I don't have an exact number, but we've seen. I think if you look at the contributors, they're from like a, at least, you know, like twenty different external uh, companies that are contributing. Yeah. This is a good moment to to have more contributors for you. Yeah, we we love to get contributors. Yeah, by the way, if you're interested in looking at it, it's it's very easy to contribute to. So the it's uh, it's mostly Python, the server, all the all the server bits, and then there's um, uh, the front end is all React. So we've had actually a lot of the features I showed, like the note taking and the scatter plot, were done by uh, people outside of Databricks. They sent a patch. They actually worked with our UI designer, uh, who you know just talked on GitHub about how to design it, and then they put it in. So. So, uh, you know, we, we tried, and that comes from the design of the platform, too, to have these a very clean APIs and data model where you can just add this stuff on top. Yeah. Great use of the audience. Okay. <laughs> any, more, any further question? Okay, yeah, there's another one. one. Yeah. Go, 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 go. That's it. Thank you for the talk. Is there any plan for the uh, .NET uh, interface or API? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, we'd love to have .NET eventually. Uh, we're not working on it right now, but I think it's um, it shouldn't be too much work to add. So it's definitely something we'd love to have. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's because my company is uh, zero latency, uh -huh. so we can't use a uh, REST API nor a uh, came online. So that's why. Got I'm it. About that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. As you can see, he's really passionate because all the questions are really good, great questions. So he always say, great <laughs> question. And, and it's cool because he loves to talk about MLflow. The last one, or you can talk with him after in the Ask the Expert if you have a question that you want to say, not with the big audience. Of course, you have the APP in the App Store and so on. You can go inside, download, Big Data Spain and all the information, all the speakers and all of that you have over there. So try to do it right now. If there is no more question, big applause for Matthew. And all right. thanks, thanks so, so much. much. Yeah. It's been an honor. Thank mm -hmm. you.